Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this session on probate. What's all the fuss about? My name's Mike Sturgis. As it says on the slide, I'm chairman of SWAT UK. Um, and so what is all the fuss about? Why have people been popping champagne corks, and not just those in our office? Last September, ICAW got approved to be a regulator for the legal services work, reserved legal services work of probate. They are the first non-solicitors, so it's the first professional body that's not a legal body to be able to authorize firms to do probate work. And initially, it was only members of ICAW or other chartered accountants, so ICAS and the Irish Institute and various others, it was only those people who could do this work. But then this year, they've opened up the floodgates. So they've basically said now, you can do this work, whatever your, audit, whatever your qualifications. So if you are chartered, certified, CIOT, step qualified, ATT, AAT, SEMA, this is now open to every practicing firm to work on. If we're looking at the application process that you have to go through, then there are certain hoops that seem a little bit strange to us because we've never had to jump through them before. And these are hoops that have been put in place by the Legal Services Board as part of the requirement for ICAW to be authorised. So we have to have a register of firms. And as at last night, 80 firms are now authorised to do probate work and the number is growing all the time. We have trained over 400 individuals. We've got courses running every other month uh, and they're getting full. So this is seen as being a popular, but part of the process that you have to do is the application form is to explain why you being regulated is going to improve access to justice. So we've actually got to put a statement as to why you should be regulated. Now, we recommend you don't say because we can stuff the solicitors. You, know, you will put a statement on along the lines of geographical area that you'll be able to cover, um, broader access to legal services, maybe new efficient ways of doing the work. But the reality is this market is open for us to take. If you are a sole practitioner, you have to have an alternate in place in case you walk under the bus or are incapacitated. You actually have to monitor diversity. That means you've got to do a survey of your team asking questions about their ethnic origin, their religious beliefs, their sexual orientation. There is no requirement for the staff to deal with that. And you don't have to have a diverse culture. I live in Cornwall. The best we can do is we've got men and women and we got English in Cornish. <laughs> that's about it. We don't really tick any other boxes. But that's not a problem so long as we monitor it and we regularly monitor it and we report back to ICAW. So they give you a form to use. They give you a process to go through. So they've made it easy for you, but you still actually have to do this. You have to have very robust complaints procedures in place. This is legal work that you're doing. So it is actually overseen and is a right to complain to the legal ombudsman. So in your letter of engagement, you will need to say that and you'll need to give all the details of that. You have to have special PI in place and the PI rules say that you must have a minimum of half a million pound for probate work. So even if your PI cover is lower for other work, you've got to have a half a million pound for probate work. Now assume you actually get some probate work where there's a million pound uh, in the estate and you've only got half a million pounds worth of cover, you can still do the work, but you have to say to the client that I'm only covered for half a million pounds. Are you sure you want to use me? And surprise, surprise, you have to be competent. Now you have to be competent initially and you have to maintain that competence. And the basis of proving that you're competent initially, unless you've already got a qualification, which we'll look at in a minute, is that you go on a course. Uh, the course is run by us, SWAT UK. Uh, we don't have a, an exclusivity on it. 
It was open and the Institute wanted about four or five people providing the courses and they wanted to let the market see who won. And everybody who was being approached looked at this and said, it's not a big enough market, nobody's going to make any money. Everybody backed out and it just left us. So we're now there, we're providing the course. It's a two-day course. Uh, it costs you £600 to go on the course. And then you have to take an assessment, which is normally about a week later. Uh, it's a two-hour assessment, multi-choice questions, questions with short written answers. Uh, the pass mark is 50%. I'm not allowed to give you the numbers of pass rates, but on the basis that most people who have come in the early days have already been doing a lot of this, the pass mark's been pretty good. The pass rate has been pretty good. So some people are getting really worked up about, oh, I've got to take an exam. I haven't taken an exam for more years, and I'm going to admit it's not that big an issue. We're not there to trick people. There are no trick questions. Everything you'll be asked is covered in the course. If you can't make a live course, we've got a webinar where we broke the two days down into four half days. And it's also recorded so that you can actually watch it at any time. The last webinar was last June. So things have moved on a little bit. So we give you sort of an update to the notes so you can download the notes. But we'll be running a new webinar in July. And if you're traveling in and out of London, you can now download the webinars onto your iPads and your iPhones and do it while you're traveling. So there's not a problem in actually going through the course. You cannot do the assessment remotely. You have to turn up and you have to prove that you are who you say you are. So you have to, you know, we're doing sort of money laundering type checks on you. We, we expect to see photo ID so that you haven't sent your mate who really knows about this, your solicitor friend, to, to do the paper for you. Uh, so you actually have to prove who you are. But that's the process, the sort of the, the outline. We are not allowed to do non-content, we are not allowed to do contentious probate, we are only allowed to do non-contentious. And there's a reason for this, uh, because if you're looking at the way the law is dealt with, then contentious process, probate, is dealt with in the Chancery Division of the Courts, non-contentious is dealt with in the family division and so what we do is we do the we do the work and as soon as it looks as it's going to go contentious we have to pass it over to a solicitor now in fairness most solicitors don't do contentious probate and there are specialist firms and all they do is contentious process pro, uh, probate or a large they'll have a division that does contentious probate and so you start the work, and you realize it's going contentious, so you hand it over to these guys who take it into the Chancery Division, and they deal with the contentious issue, but then it comes back to the Family Division for the probate to be done. So they don't do that, they pass it back to you. So you've got a nice sort of strategic alliance going on there. Now, what's gonna make it contentious? Well, we can have a range of things, that's going to get people upset. The first one is it could be disputes over the will. It could be disputes over the drafting or the, you know, what the words in the will mean. It could be disputes over whether the person was actually put under undue pressure when they made the will or that they're, they're maybe they didn't have the mental capacity. There could be a, a, a claim that I should have been included in the will because I'm a dependent and I've been left out of the will. There could be actions against a personal rep representative for negligence, for fraud, for theft. There could be trust litigation, or they could be trying to get rid of the personal representative. So there's a lot of things that can go on around this process. Now, when you apply, if you apply, there are two routes that you can go down. There's the authorized and the licensed. And the authorized is aimed at smaller firms because it means every principal in the firm has to go through and be an authorized individual. Now, if you're a sole practitioner, then the principal, the, the sole practitioner, has to be authorized. And fair enough, if you're a two or three partner firm, you might look at getting them all authorized. But as you get into the larger firms, there will be some partners that don't want to go and do probate work, so you go down a licensed route. So then what you have is a number of individuals, think of it like audit, where you have, you're an audit registered firm and you have responsible individuals and you have others that are definitely irresponsible as far as audits are concerned. Okay? And this is gonna be the same for probate. 
And we've already got that with competent individuals for uh, investment business and incompetent individuals for investment business. Now, as at last night, I said there are 80 firms. We have 25 authorized and 55 who are licensed. So I can give you the, the hint of the range. And we've got from sole practitioners up to major firms. If you're a licensed firm, then you have to have at least one principal who is authorized. Any non-authorized people who've got a material interest, which is defined as 10% holding, 10% voting rights, shareholding, equity rights, you know, they also need to be, uh, if you like, passed by ICAW. And so as part of that, everybody has to be fit and proper. You have to have a head of legal practice. And the job of the head of legal practice is to make sure that the whole firm complies with the regulations. And you have a head of financial asset, uh, financial, uh, finance and administration. And the head of finance and administration is there to make sure that the client's money in their assets are protected. So in a sense, the person in charge of the client account. This is only authorization for England and Wales, so you have to have either be a, a company or an LLP registered in England and Wales, or you have to have an office in England and Wales. Any principal who's not authorized uh, and who's not a chartered accountant has to become an affiliate. So an affiliate is somebody who's got all the obligations of being a member of the institute, but none of the rights, other than, of course, the right to do uh, probate work, if, that's, uh, if you're authorized. Non-authorized must be informed of their duties, that this is what the obligations that the firm has to go through. They're not allowed to control probate, so in the same way we can't have non-responsible individuals interfering with audit work uh, or people who are not competent interfering with investment business, so we have the same with probate. And I've already mentioned the PI, you've got a minimum of half a million pounds cover. The conduct of work is just like for any other service that you're providing. You have to be independent. You have to be objective. We have to apply proper standards. We've got to keep all the information confidential, but above all, we've got to have the client's best interests at heart. So there's nothing unusual there. It's exactly the same as we would apply to any other professional work we do. So we have these different levels there. We've got an authorized individual who's the person who has to control probate work. Very similar to the responsible individual. That doesn't mean you've got to do it all, but you're the person in charge and you're the one who gets the blame if there's a technical term called a cock up. So it's your, in a sense, your head on the block. You're the one who's going to be explaining what went wrong. As we've mentioned, we've got this head of legal practice who has to be an authorized principal, uh, or if you're the only person, you're the ICAW contact partner if you're an authorized firm, and you've got the head of finance and uh, administration. There are three routes to becoming authorized by ICAW. And the first route is you are a member of a, an accountancy body which is defined as the Institute of Chartered Accountants in England, Wales, of Scotland, Ireland, we've got the New Zealand and Australia, we've got South Africa, we've got Zimbabwe, so the chartered institutes. If you're one of them, then, you need, then, then you've got the, sort of the first tick and then you have to go on the course and prove competency and pass the assessment. The other one is you're already approved by another body allowed to regulate probate. So you're a solicitor, for example, joining a multidisciplinary practice and they're coming with that experience and that's fine. They don't need to go on our course. They're already competent. And then you've got the third option, which is available of anybody else who's going to be authorized. And that's where we're going to bring in the other qualifications. And the way the Institute was dealing with it is they said, well, the chartered, we know they've reached this level in their exam, so we need to top them up to this level. But we don't know what the other level of exams are, so we need a different course for them. And we actually went to the Institute and said, well, actually, I don't like to tell you this, but we assumed that some of the people who've come on the course qualified a long time ago and may not have got this level of competence, or if they did, they've forgotten it. So we actually started from scratch, so it's exactly the same course. So that was one of the reasons why there was a delay in bringing the others in. But it's effectively going to be the same process. Technically, it's under a different section, but it's the same process. 
Now, I mentioned that we have to have uh, complaints procedures in place, robust complaints procedures. In your letter of engagement, you have to say that this is regulated, reserved legal work, uh, and that they have the right to complain to the legal ombudsman, and you have to give all the details of the legal ombudsman. If you're looking at complaints, then you've got to respond to a complaint. You've got to acknowledge a complaint within five working days of receiving it. And it's then got to have an independent internal evaluation and you try to resolve it. If it's not resolved in eight weeks, you have to remind them of their right to complain to the legal ombudsman. You don't want them to do this because he invariably fines for the complaintiff because you haven't sorted it. Unless it's a completely spurious complaint, you're probably going to lose. So sort it before it gets there. So how much does this lot cost? Well, if we're looking at this process, you've got different fees being charged, whether you're authorized or licensed, and it's based on the number of principles, and it's based on the number of authorized individuals you've got. So you're adding the two together. So if you've got non-principals who, who are authorized individuals, you're adding them into the number. So if you're a sole practitioner, you need to have a 350 pound annual fee, but you also have to pay into the compensation, compensation scheme in case you go bust um, and the PI is not enough or it's not covered by the PI and they've lost money. So there's a, there's a sort of legal compensation scheme that's in place. And we all have to, all those who are going through this process have to comply with that. As you can see, uh, the licensed, it's the same if you're a sole practitioner because effectively you're authorized. But as you move up, you can see that the, the fees are greater for the number of partners you've got if you're a licensed practice and if they're authorized. Now, if you're going through this process, you can see at the plus 50, then okay, they're not going to be authorized at plus 50. So it's going to cost for about £10,000 if you only do it in one office. The fees increase if you're going to do probate work. It's not how many offices you've got, it's how many offices are you going to do probate work in. And if you're 50 plus partners and you've got 10 plus offices and you're going to do probate in all of them, it's going to cost you 50 grand a year. But I can't imagine why anybody would want to start with doing probate in more than one office. You know, it's not going to be huge to start with. It's going to become huge. If you want my prediction, uh, within five years, if you ignore the big four, if you're going ignoring the really big firms, then audit, I think, the fees you earn from audit will be less than the fees you earn from probate in the future. You know, we've got a 10 million audit threshold coming in. How many of our firms are still going to be doing audits? Even those who are, they're going to have fewer and fewer audits. The fees that firms can earn from this, I think, is going to be significantly more than audit until you get to right up to the larger firms when I think, yes, they'll still be, audit will still be a major player there. So the fees are there. They are payable. On top of that, don't forget that you've got to then train people. So you're paying uh, people to be trained. Uh, Matt, our marketing director, uh, reminded me to say to you that I've told you the price is 600 and 150. There's, a, there's an account tech exhibition offer of 10% off that if you book it before the end of May. If you're watching this on the video, sorry, by the time the video comes out, the deadline's gone. So you're back to full price, I'm afraid, guys. What can you actually do anyway? If you are not authorized, what can you already do and what are firms already doing? And the answer is most of it, to be honest, a lot. So you can already produce accounts and the tax returns up to the date of death. You can do all of that. You can establish all the assets of the deceased. You can work out what the values of those assets are. You can work out what the deceased liability is. You can identify past gifts for IHT. You can calculate the IHT. You can complete the IHT forms. You can do full estate administration, divvying up all the assets to the people. You can act as executor, and if you wanted, I wouldn't recommend it unless you've got solicitors in the practice, but if you wanted, you could write a will and draft a deed of variation. So some of you will be thinking, what's left? <laughs> and the answer is one thing. 
What you cannot do is apply for probate on PA1. You can do that for free. And I've heard lecturers stand up and say, not a problem, just do it all. And on your timesheet, put two hours at zero pounds for that little bit. Because you've done it for free now, and so that's not a problem. Imagine this has just gone pear-shaped, and it's now gone to court. And the court is saying, but you've just done the grant of probate, and you're not authorised. Ah, oh, but I didn't charge. Well, what numbers did you put on the probate? Were the numbers I'd calculated before. Did you charge for that? Yes. So actually, you charged for doing the work to do the PA. Well, no, I didn't charge for that time. Yeah, but you did the work. And if they, this hasn't been tested in court, and I, my recommendation is don't try to be the first one to get tested on. Because if you lose, you've just committed a criminal act. You've committed a criminal offence. You've just then done reserved legal work without authorisation. If you're a member of ICAW, um, they're going to take disciplinary action against you. You've committed a criminal act, so your PI won't cover you. And you could actually go to jail or be fined. I think it's very dangerous what's being said by some of the presenters that I've listened to. And I really would not recommend, just don't go there. Tell the client, here's the figures, take them to a solicitor or take them to somebody else, take them to an intelligent friend and go down to the office and do it yourself. So if you take that approach, you don't need to be authorised. So why would you want to be authorised? And the answer is because you can then say to the client, we can do it all. What are the two certainties in life? Death and taxes. And if you're authorised, you can advise on both. You can deal with both issues. I'm, I'd love to see the first firm change their branding from chartered accountants and business advisors to chartered accountants and certainty advisors. Because that's what we're going to be dealing with. We're going to be dealing with certainty, death in taxes. Now, there is still excluded reserved legal work. You cannot do contentious probate. We've already said that. But neither can you do administration of an oath. Now, ICW is looking at other reserved work legal areas and saying, should we go for authorization? If you've ever done, had to go and give an oath, and I just signed up for a lease for our new, our angel offices, re-signed the lease, were excluded from Landlord and Tenant Act, I had to give an oath to say, I understand this. And I wandered along to a solicitor and I spent 20 minutes with the solicitor while he filled the forms out and I raised my hand and it cost me eight pounds. So I'm not convinced many of you will want to go into the area where you can get a recovered rate of 24 pounds an hour for the work that you're doing. And by the way, you pay it to the solicitors in cash. I did ask whether I had to make a money laundering declaration. <laughs> uh, I'm told that it kind of goes into a slush fund and it goes towards a Christmas party or something like that. You know, I'm sort of thinking, pardon? <laughs> you shouldn't be telling me this. We cannot draft a trust deed either. So these are the reserved legal areas that we cannot do if we're authorised to do probate. <clears throat> so why should a client come to us if we're authorised to do probate work. I mean, apart from the fact you know, that they know us, they trust us, they see us every year, we know about their business, we know about their activities. I'm amazed at the amount of knowledge you guys have about your clients and their family histories in everything that's going on. We've got details of a load of their assets for tax purposes. We actually understand tax. We actually can complete an IHT form properly. Anecdotal evidence from my client says every time they get an IHT form from a solicitor, chances are they've done it wrong. So we actually know this stuff. We are good at systems. We are good at process. This is a process. This is what we're trained for. And by the way, 
we are likely to stuff them on fees. That's a technical term you may not have come across. But the solicitors charge for their hourly rate and then a percentage of the estate. The banks just charge a percentage of the estate. I had a partner whose father-in-law died with a very complex estate and he went to the solicitors and asked for a quote and fell off the chair in surprise. So he went to the bank who was about 50% more expensive than the solicitor. So he said, oh, I'm going to do it myself. So he went away and he learned how to do it and he charged all the time notionally through his firm to learn how to do it and to do the complete job. And at 100% recovery rate on partner time, he came in at two thirds of the price of solicitors, including all the time to learn how to do this. We can take these guys to the cleaner. The question is not why should they use us, is why won't they use us? So one of the early probate firms who was authorized, I contact them and say, how's it going? And at the beginning when they were authorized, they wrote to every client. And in the first six months of authorization, so you can tell this is one of the firms that was authorized back in September time, October time. And in that first six months, they've got six jobs. It's not their clients are dying, um, but they wrote to all the clients. And when a death happened in the family, they often dragged out this letter. Now of those six clients, two were with solicitors and two were with bankers. And the family got them both replaced by the accountant, all of them replaced by the accountant. One of them was a farm. It was dad had died and left the daughter to the farm. And the farm was worth a million pounds. And the bank was the executor and they were going to charge 4%. There were no other real assets. So they were going to charge 40,000 pounds to transfer the farm from dad's name into the daughter's name. No IHT to pay. It was going to do that. So they got them kicked into touch. The accountant actually said, you don't really need me to do it. I'll do it if you want, but I can talk you through it. And he charged a few thousand pounds. So, and he made super profits on that. He's got a happy client. He's amazing client care. And that's probably the best piece of marketing this guy's ever done. Because guess what's going to happen? She's going to tell everybody how much the bank was going to charge and what she paid the accountant. And you can't buy that sort of marketing. That's going to be amazing stuff there. We'll talk about marketing in a moment. So how are we going to deal with this? How do you analyze your client base? Well, I, I put the first one up as a joke, you see, because I said, well, is the client still breathing? If not, it's too late. And then I spoke to some of the clients and said, oh, well, actually, it may not be too late because most of the ones that came to this first accountant, the people had already died. And they already had executives in place, but they'd got the letter and they knew the firm did it. And they said, can I come and talk to you? So is he breathing? Well, if he's not, it may be too late, but don't give up. So once we get past the tongue in cheek bit, does the client need probate? Is it a simple estate? If it's really simple, they don't even need probate, the, the value is so low, um, then there's nothing for you to do. If it's a really simple estate, which really is, although it can be big money, that, that farm was a simple estate, we said, well, the family can do it. Now, bear in mind, with probate work, the people who are coming to you are not happy bunnies. They're very emotionally upset. You know, they're feeling very fragile. They're vulnerable. So it may be that they just say, just do it. And you've got to be there to just do it. But they may also be worried about the fees. If you think of that farm, they were going to get a bill for £40,000. They didn't have £40,000 because all the asset was tied up in the farm. What are they going to have to do? Sell some fields? So they can be very conscious. And part of your obligation is actually at the start to say, this is what it's going to cost you. This is what we're going to do, and this is how much it's going to cost you. And if it actually looks as if you're going to go over those costs, you've got to go back and say, well, actually, I think it's going to be a bit more complicated. It's going to be more. And then you've got to talk to them about what options they've got. So cost can be an issue here. But what we're really looking for are those estates which are complicated, where we've got trusts involved, where we've got lots of other assets involved, maybe property that needs to be sold, that sort of thing, where it's not really going to be easy to, for them to do this. So who are your target clients? 
if you're looking at your target clients, we really need to be looking at the sort of services that you're providing and who's using those services. I mean, clearly we are looking for high net worth individuals, owners of a business that's worth a bob or two, you know, people with family trusts, that sort of thing. So look at the services that you provide. If you do any IHT work with a client, they're gonna be a target. So they're coming to you, you're assessing the IHT and you're saying you've got a bit of an issue here. We need to put some steps in place to minimize, to mitigate IHT. Now, surely it then makes sense to them say, right, we've put all this work in to try and protect you on IHT. It's pretty important when we come to fill out the forms, I'm sorry you won't be around at that time, but it's pretty important that whoever does this understands what we've done. Would you like it to be us? Because we understand what we've just done for you. Doesn't that make sense? If you are talking to them about their will, then clearly that makes sense to say, would you like us to deal with this? We've, we've helped you structure your will. We haven't written it, hopefully. But what I would suggest to people is you create the equivalent of a heads of agreement. You know, if you were doing a deal, you wouldn't necessarily write the sale purchase agreement or the, the practice acquisition agreement or anything like that yourself, but you would have a heads of agreement. So let's set out, and you might set up a template, say these are the things, this is what you're giving to whom, this is how you want to set it up, and by the way, who do you want to be executors? Would you like us to do it? And then you give that to somebody to write the will. If you've got an IFA department, so you are doing financial services work, this is a no-brainer, because they are always talking to clients about IHT, about life insurance, about critical illness, you know, about permanent health insurance. They're always looking at how we can actually make sure you're covered. Well, this is one of the areas. If you're talking to clients about succession planning and exit strategies, you know, okay, so you're gonna sell your shares. At the moment, your main asset is your business and your shares. When you turn that into cash, you're gonna have an IHT liability. What are we going to do about that? Let's put some strategies in place. Would you like us to protect that when we need to implement it? Would you like us to be the executors? And so you can go on. We're doing a business valuation. Why are you doing a business valuation? Well, I'm thinking about exiting the business or we're looking at selling the business um, or I'm getting divorced <laughs> and the other half wants to know. Well, any of those is me. Oh, you probably need to update your will as well. You're going to have this liability. And then you start the conversation going again. Any trust work that you're doing with clients will lead into that. So you can see there's a huge amount of work that we're doing. But it doesn't have to be that. As we said with the first, the first firm I spoke to, they just wrote to every client. They weren't interested in a categorizing their clients. They said, well, we'll let everybody know. And I think you should do that anyway. But then you start to say, well, who do we really want? Now, I talked about why clients should use you, but of course, what you're trying to get is new clients as well, which is where we start to move into some of the uh, other activities that you're going to be doing. So we're going to be looking at strategic alliances. Now, the key strategic alliance, if you haven't got an IFA in-house and you, you work with an IFA, is go talk to them about this service because you fit together much better than a solicitor because you're going to be much more referring work to them, and now you want them to refer work back to you. So that if they're talking to clients about wills, about life insurance, and all this stuff, you want them to mention that you can do the probate work. So an IFA. Now, you'd imagine that solicitors would not be a good target for being a strategic alliance partner. But what if you've got a firm of solicitors in the town who don't do probate work? You've got a commercial firm of solicitors in there. Who would they prefer to send their clients to for probate? You, an accountant, or the other firm down the road that does probate solicitors, but also does commercial and all the rest of it? I think they'd want to come to you. You are going to need, if it goes pear-shaped, to pass work across to a probate specialist solicitor. So there's a potential there. So we've spoken to a number of probate solicitors who do this contentious work, and we say, where do you get your work from? They don't do the basic probate because they, they, why would you want to bite the hand that feeds you? 
So they do the contentious bit and then pass it back. But occasionally, somebody will go directly to them wanting to contest the will. And in those situations, they then look to farm it out to somebody who can do the, the basic probate. And we say, well, who do you choose? They say, well, we choose people who send work to us, obviously. So you've got the potential there. And, and the firm I talked to early on said, well, I actually happen to have in my client base a couple of undertakers. <laughs> and he said, so I've talked to them about it, and I've left some leaflets with them. Now, clearly, there's going to be different sort of clients that's going there. There'll be a lot of clients that don't need probate, or they've got very simple stuff. But nevertheless, you can have a conversation with them. And you say, well, you actually don't need it, or actually, we can help you through it, but you can do most of it yourself if you want, or we can do it all for you. And you have those conversations again. But you can see how strongly this ties in to everything that you do. So what do we do about marketing for this? And the answer is a lot more than most firms are doing. Has anybody heard of Libby Lane? Has anybody heard of Bishop Libby Lane? She was the first woman bishop. And she was on national television. She's on the front pages of the newspapers. It's a big story. I'm involved with the Church of England down in Truro. And we had a new suffragan bishop, which is a sort of the second tier bishop, which is what Libby Lane is. She's not, the, she's not the main diocesan bishop. And he hardly, when he was appointed, we hardly got anything in the papers. Nobody was interested. It's an also run. It's just another bishop. But Libby Lane was on the front pages. What do we have here? Not the fact that you've been authorised, but what we're marketing here is the fact this is a major change in the way reserved legal services are delivered. This is the first time non-legal people have been allowed to do reserved legal work. This is huge. And by the way, we're the first in the town who can do this. And with only 80 firms, most of you, if you go for this, you're going to be the first. And if not, you say, and we're one of the first. And one of the firms was the first ever to be done. And that's on the home page. We were the first ever to be authorised. And the firm I spoke to was in Wales. We're the first in Wales to be authorised. And others were the first in Liscard, where I live, or wherever it is. And you make a thing about this. So on your website, you don't do what some firms have done, which is tuck it away at the back if you go in through their services and you get down into personal services and into trust and tucked away at the bottom of trust. So, oh, by the way, we do probate. You know, that's not really what I would be recommending. I think you should be shouting about this on the website. You should have articles every month on the website. You put an article up about the fact that, hey, here's the photos. We're authorized, guys. Please don't do what one firm said is, we've just qualified. It makes it sound as if you're, you know, you guys have been doing this for ages, but now you can do all of it. You've been doing 98% of it. Now you can do the 100% legally. And isn't this great news? So you put an article up about what can go wrong with a will, what a good will looks like, what can go wrong at probate, rules about intestacy, articles about the basics of IHT, you know, some of the strategies, some of the things that people can do, how to determine an IHT liability. Now, you don't want to give away too much information because you want them to come to you, but you get a lot of information on there. Then you start to use that in your newswires that go out in your newsletters. So you keep referring back to those articles. You put press releases out, majoring on the fact this is a, this is a huge change in the way legal services are delivered in our area. Because until now, only solicitors and banks could do this. Now we can as well. So this, this is what you're majoring on. You can start to put client seminars together. If you've got an IFA, you could start to maybe do a joint seminar with them, as long as they're good speakers as well. You could maybe contact a contentious probate guy and say, would you like to come in? So one of the large firms down in, in the Southwest is looking at putting on a seminar for accountants about probate because they do contentious probate. So they're looking for more people to do this so they can refer work to them. And they've asked us to come along and do part of that seminar. So you could bring these people in to talk to them about that. If you're into social media, by the way, you really ought to be, 
Then you start to tweet this, you start to use Facebook, LinkedIn. You can do little YouTubes and put them up and have your YouTube videos up on there. If you do a search on YouTube for probate, you don't find a lot. But there's one, there's a solicitor who's doing a lovely 15 minute fireside chat. So she sat in a, uh, in a nice comfy seat, the fire's in the corner. She's obviously just set the, the video up herself and done it. And she's just chatting for 15 minutes about some of the issues and why you, know, you need to use a solicitor. And that's the sort of thing that you could do. It doesn't need to be amazingly sophisticated and video edited. And have some leaflets, have some brochures professionally printed that you leave in your op office. If you're going to the undertaker, you leave some there for them. You can hand out to people, you can attach to the letter that you're writing to clients, listing the sort of things that you can do to help. So there's this huge circle of things there. And I think if we, actually take this seriously and we have a good crack at this, we can take this marketplace completely. We really can. The only reason it won't happen is because we're too timid. And let's be honest, as accountants, we're not the best salespeople in the world. But we're better than solicitors and bankers. So we could actually do this. Now I've got five minutes left if anybody's got any questions. Madam. Okay, so you're a sole practitioner. Your other half owns 20% of the business. Um, you're qualified. Uh, he's not. Okay, so he would have a material interest. He would need to be approved by ICAW, be fit and proper. He's got to comply with all the rules. Uh, he can't interfere with you uh, and tell you what to do, so you tell him to back out. <laughs> um, and uh, he... he but one thing I didn't mention is all people with material interest and all principles have to go through the DBS, the, the old CRB tests. And that's another £49 per person. So you all have to do that. Um, so provided he goes through that and ICW doesn't dislike him because he's been banned from being in probate or doing anything like that, or he's convicted of something he shouldn't be doing, um, then there shouldn't be a problem. Any other questions? Well, I'm around until about one o'clock, so if you want to come and see us on stand 572, A572, uh, if you've got any other questions, you can have a chat then. But thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>